Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar, Fix Dead End Searches and Boost E-Commerce Conversions. My name is Jill and I'm today's webinar host. We're joined by LucidWorks guest speakers, Mark Bird, who is data science delivery uh, in our data science delivery department, and Eric Redman, who is the head of product strategy for Fusion. Before we begin, I have just a few housekeeping items. We are recording this presentation and it will be available after today. We will be following up with an email after today's presentation. Please use the Q&A widget on your viewing console to submit questions at any time during today's presentations. We're gonna reserve the last few minutes for a live Q&A. And if you need any technical assistance, just reach out also through the Q&A and I'll be glad to give you one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now I'm incredibly delighted to turn it over to you, Eric. Thank you, Jill. Mark and I are going to essentially have a conversation as we work our way through these topics. Well, one of us will take one topic, the other will uh, ask questions a little bit like a chat. And so uh, as we go through that chat, we'll be covering three types or three approaches to semantic search and how those approaches help out with these dead end or null result searches. So let's start, Mark, let's start with this idea of a null result or a dead end search. Like why do these happen? And, and so we, we, there's a number of times when the product just isn't there. Someone's entering a pretty specific query and it's out of stock or it's not carried. Um, uh, it, it's just not available anymore, or the shopper or the buyer could be looking for something that is a different brand than what is carried by the e-commerce the e site. Sometimes we see queries that are more of what someone's trying to accomplish, which I wish that worked uh, better all the time because I love to know the goal of the shopper. But in fact, today with the, the typical lexical approaches, it doesn't work very well. So if someone is querying, for example, for um, I want something fun to do at the beach over spring break, our kind of standard lexical approaches don't, don't work very well in that case. Uh, so, another type of thing. Oh, Mark, go ahead. Yeah. So when you when you mentioned one of the first ones there is out of stock, and for e-commerce uh, sites especially, you have lots of, of changes in stock, mm -hmm. um, interruptions, as you said. Maybe one product is superseded with another. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Yeah, for sure. And the bottom one on the list here, this uh, the shopper's query is very specific. We'll dive into that a little bit, uh, a couple slides down. But basically, when when the shopper is looking for something where the specifications are very important to them, uh, such as uh, color, size, et cetera, et cetera, or, or even... Uh, uh, applicability to some other product that they already have, like they're looking for an accessory that's compatible. So compatibility could be a type of specification. And we have approaches with lexical search to deal with these. Uh, the, one of the older ones is a partial match, but the problem is in that partial match isn't really knowledgeable about what parts of the query are super important and what parts are or not. So we'll, we'll get into that one too. So, so Mark, why not, I'm going to turn the next slide over to yeah. you because you've talked to me about this long tail thing a lot. Yeah. So uh, people may be familiar with the long tail distribution of, of queries and the demand for keywords and phrases from sort of an SEO perspective. But the same principles are important for us in, in query and the optimization of query and, and uh, finding in e-commerce contexts. So short tail 
queries are those that have a very high volume, um, somewhat predictable, well-trod, and uh, almost always get, get a good click-through rate or conversion rate. Long-tail queries, on the other hand, are infrequent, specialized, and uh, the, the tail itself is very long, right? That, mm -hmm. that if we consider a query we've never seen before, that's kind of um, way out there on that tail. So it, null searches are those where you don't get any results, right? Which is a, not a good experience for users. And mm -hmm. uh, these long tail queries tend to be kind of just adjacent to those. Maybe you only get a few results. Um, the click-through rate isn't great. But from an optimization point of view, if we think about moving up the conversion rate in that, in that tail section, there's a lot of, of opportunity mm. there. So there, we may start with null queries, but this is kind of their next door neighbor. Yeah. So the way you're talking about this, it's, uh, it sounds like you don't mean it's a hard rule that uh, null searches live in the long tail. And, and by the way, um, uh, we have this diagram from probably an SEO perspective from Composely, but uh, they're using this for a short tail keywords. I kind of, I think of that as the head. So in case anyone's wondering what this short tail business is. Um, yeah, so, so I just wonder if you had some thoughts about how null searches can kind of stray from the general rule of thumb of living out there in the long tail. That's a that's a great point, and really one of the the bad things that can happen is if you have a very frequent search phrase that mm -hmm. is getting empty results, right? You'd mm -hmm. almost want an alert for that or something, right? And mm -hmm. that can happen if there are uh, changes in inventory uh, or other changes to the system that that lead to that sort of an unanticipated result. And because those are high conversion rate queries it's pretty urgent to fix those or avoid them in the first place. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a mistake too. I've seen where there is some problem in publishing a change to a product that starts uh, throwing out those null results at that point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark, should we move on? Yeah. Okay, good for the long tail. All right, so specificity, that's one of the things I talked about in that first slide about why do we get null results. And so I've got a, a two or three slides here kind of digging into that a little bit. And one kind of specificity is that it's sort of unintentional. People will, uh, they will genericize is the word I use here, a brand name such as Pampers or Kleenex. Um, and, and so if someone is searching for Pampers instead of diapers and the retailer carries some other brand, we want to be able to adapt to that. And we want to be able to do it uh, learning from the shopper behavior and not having to have someone curating all the time like, oh, people are searching for this, let's point them to that. We'd like uh, a semantic approach that gets the meaning of the brand. If it, if it had, Pampers doesn't just sell diapers, but that's a very prominent meaning behind it. So Eric, you mentioned Kleenex, and I think we're all very familiar with that. And it's rare that somebody might say a facial tissue uh, yeah. in, instead, but, uh, um, what about when somebody really is looking for a specific brand and they have some some brand attachment and stuff? Is there a way we can best yeah. handle? Yeah, I think um, especially when we're doing semantic search in a way that is trying to be general or say this is similar, we can use messaging. We we can know when the system is going to a semantic search approach and. Uh, 
messaging could be along the lines of we couldn't find exactly what you're looking for, but here are some alternatives we think you'll find useful. And then the, the, the proof of is that a good approach becomes apparent pretty quickly in the signals. Uh, are those alternatives generating engagement and conversion? All right, let's look at another one. So another type of specificity that's kind of idiomatic is when you have a trade, a plumber, an electrician, a carpenter, or, uh, or a professional photographer, they may tend to use a kind of shorthand because if, I, if I'm searching for a lens, then I'm probably meaning millimeters. And there's some other stuff. There's an implied brand here, I would argue, in this example I'm showing, along with that unit of measurement. And so I, I want to touch on this here. We tend, I think we tend to, over the past few years, when we say semantic search, semantic is about searching by meaning. But there's also almost this implication of um, fuzzy or um, it, it's not very precise. And there's no reason why when we say semantic search that we have to mean imprecise. It's just kind of the nature of some of the models that are common, becoming more commonplace today to solve these kinds of problems. So I want to talk a little bit later about semantic Mean or meaning can be very specific, as in this case here. Yeah, and and before you move on, so in this case, the user has has not specified their units. Um, back when I was a, a physics undergrad, I was taught that you should always always specify the units, mm -hmm. and uh, unit analysis can help you solve some problems. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the user has implied the those units and mm -hmm. um, on the other side of implying is inferring right so and we yeah. talk about inference a lot in data science and and so what you're saying here i think is that we're going to try to make an inference here about these units right right and uh, actually I didn't mean to describe a solution more as this makes it hard <laughs> when people do this. Yeah. Let's look at uh, another one. Color is one of my favorite topics. And color is such a rich concept uh, that, in fact, for more than 100 years, of uh, people who deal with color uh, dyes, trying to help people with their vision issues they may have, uh, uh, anything that would be colored with a dye, there's a big problem in trying to be consistent. And if somebody asks for a color from a manufacturer, it's important that they, that they could communicate. What are we talking about here? So, you know, the old, old approach that's still used today is, well, I'm gonna give you a sample. It should be like this. But another approach, and honestly, this has been in development for more than 100 years, is to describe color in a three-dimensional space where we can kind of lay things out and see how, how they're related. And I'll get into that in some more detail down the road here. But this is kind of one of the early vector uh, search approaches, uh, not necessarily using computers at first, but people, you know, working out similarities by hand. So here's an example. Uh, if, if somebody searches for color, and that let's say it is a shopper who's shopping for some type of apparel, they're likely to use sort of common colors, the kind of colors you seeing a box of crayons or looking up colors on Wikipedia, something like denim, for example. But uh, marketing uh, teams, e-commerce retailers, they use color to evoke some emotion. That color name is another tool that they use to sell something. So they're not trying to be precise. 
Uh, otherwise, they could just put a, a color space coordinate in numbers there. They're trying to evoke some emotion, and that creates a mismatched vocabulary. So, Eric, is it the case that sometimes, uh, you know, like you said, there's the box of crayons colors, almost references in, in, in standards. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the case that sometimes a brand might actually have their own sort of trademarked colors? And yeah. again, as a way of uh, evoking emotion and identity, helping people identify with that brand. Um, how do we handle those kind of challenges? You know, it's true. So there's a challenge, but there's also an opportunity here. There are loyal shoppers, let's just stick with apparel, who do come to know the kind of the color vocabulary uh, of their that favorite brand's uh, marketing. These colors, though, these color names, they could come out, they could change monthly, certainly seasonally, and it won't be the same color as last year because the world is different, and we're, we're trying to evoke emotion with, with uh, phrases that resonate today. That's the marketing perspective. But these loyal shoppers, they are staying on top of it, and there are even discussion groups around, believe it or not, around, you know, a favorite apparel lines, color names, and so on. What's this like? Is it like the, the old Bay Indigo or something different? And so when those shoppers, and you can kind of identify them in signals, when those shoppers are searching, they can really help teach us or teach a system about uh, how those colors relate to, to more standard colors. You have loyal shoppers, and then you have kind of um, not a novice, but they're unfamiliar with the brand. You mix those all together, and you can teach a model quite a bit about how color is used in that particular brand. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that got to your question. Totally. Okay. All right. So I, I talked a little bit about color search, and uh, I don't know if you knew this, Mark, but their Pantone publishes a color of the year every year. And the color of the year for 2022 is Very Perry, which is a cute name for Periwinkle. Uh, and and so let's let's just say I picked that because uh, it would not be weird for someone this year to be searching for Periwinkle at an apparel site because Pantone doesn't just make this up. They're not they're not trying to sell a color. They are drawing this from. Uh, a whole wide variety of sources where they learn about how people are using color that year. And so somebody might search for periwinkle and then, you know, periwinkle top or periwinkle skirt. And that top image I have there, we couldn't find that item. That's, that's a real thing. I went to an apparel site and couldn't find it. However, now you, I can predict some people will say that skirt is not the same color as periwinkle. But I don't think you would argue that it's totally out of the ballpark, right? So I, I'm just showing here that uh, one approach to dealing with semantics specific to color is to take advantage of that idea of a color space, a standard color space, and to be able to find close enough. And who's going to tell us what's close enough? Well, there again, we can go back to the signals and watch how shoppers are reacting to that. And we might, maybe we would say, we need to tighten up a little bit on this periwinkle definition. So this, uh, as you said, Pantone has chosen this or, or identified it maybe more from, from trends as the color of the year. Uh, not only defining the name of it, but I bet they've also defined some objectively expressible quantities about that color, right? Yeah, there are a few standard color um, 
I'll, I'll just use that word space. I don't know a better, better word. Uh, and one of those is called C Lab, C I E Lab. And picture a three dimensional space that they have tried over decades to make a representation of human perception of color and, and then to be able to say how close, if you will, in that space, this color is to that color. And so, yeah, we could, we can use that kind of color space. And even if this apparel vendor did not tell us the coordinates of this color, they might tell us in some other system uh, of color coordinates and we could translate, or we could even read the color off of their images that they use as a kind of a color swatch and find that color's place in a color space. All right, so here is a, this is a kind of a cool image of a color space. Um, and I mentioned C Lab. Uh, there's a challenge here. I mentioned that uh, various uh, groups have worked hard for a hundred years or more trying to get this color space right to really reflect human perception. And uh, it's not perfect. I mean, they made a lot of improvements. You can almost picture it like, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh-oh, we messed up, and then they have to put a corrective lens on it, so to speak. A lot of that has happened with this color space because uh, we learned over time that, for one thing, when you get to a edge like here's blue, and here's green, and you get close to that crossover between what most people would call blue and most people would call green, It you have to be really precise in describing the color that would be made uh, from a mix like turquoise or something that's near that edge. You have to be really, you have a really small place in this color space to where people would, yeah, that's close enough to turquoise. But then when you're out right in the middle of blue, you have a big range where uh, most people would say, yeah, that's still blue, you can move quite a bit. So that's a problem with this color space. You can't just say, someone has given me a color they're shopping for, I wanna find the colors that are within this distance because it doesn't work. And what, what might be suitable for a blue um, close enough is not suitable for a turquoise close enough. So, and, and I guess there are other color spaces besides C-Lab, right? People might be familiar with RGB, red, green, yeah. blue, um, that browsers exactly. and other things use. Um, and a lot of times, like you said, we can actually pick those up from images in the catalog or, um, yeah. you know, maybe there's there's parameters that come through with, when we crawl and index that data uh, to turn them into vectors. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and regarding this sort of um, Hubble telescope correction that's gone on over the years, that can be customized to a particular vendor. So if, if I am shopping at a kind of a chic uh, clothing for women place, I think I'm gonna make a generalization and say that that kind of vendor, their shoppers are going to be a little more color knowledgeable and want a little more precision versus uh, when someone wants, um, I'm gonna fail at this example, but let, let's just say they want some blue jeans. What are blue jeans? What are white jeans and so on? You could be a little looser there. So uh, capturing signals again, there is a way that we could have a whole nother talk about this, but there's a way to start with something like this C-Lab color space and 
teach a model to start from there and learn about these sort of peculiarities with how people at that site interact with color. I think, Mark, I think you're going to tell us about a little bit about semantic vector search. Yeah. Now, so I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, so I had mentioned up top that we would talk about kind of three approaches that fit in the semantic search world. We started with color, and here we are with the second one. Okay, take it away. So semantic vector search, you know, the, the image we've got here is that like similar products are, are organized together for shoppers, right? So that mm -hmm. when when they're engaging on their their shopping journey, they 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 kind of know where to find things. Um, and we can do similar things on the algorithm side uh, with search by using semantic vectors. So, and we'll talk a little bit uh, here about some of those definitions, but just. As an orientation, that that's a little bit about what we're talking about. So, uh, but this is all also informed by the system's sort of feedback loop, right? That users mm -hmm. engage with certain uh, products based on their their queries, uh, based on their navigation. Um, maybe certain shoppers abandon. Uh, a certain search results and start over from the beginning and then end up buying something, right? That's mm -hmm. a very important signal. Um, and then what about when shoppers do a search and get no results and then they, they end up buying something else, right? Again, mm -hmm. very strong signal in part because of the cost that the user undertook to, um, mm -hmm. to get to their goal. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, so the, these signals, along with other kind of input data, can allow us to put these uh, these products into a vector space, such that similar products are together and dis dissimilar products are farther apart. Just like mm -hmm. you know, colors might have been in some of the earlier uh, discussion there. Yeah, I like I like that connection to the cost of a, a signal, and this idea of costly signals appears in signaling theory in lots of fields. And one of those being evolutionary biology. So it's really fun to make the connections uh, to what we're talking about here in e-commerce and in other fields. And so I think what you were getting at if i i'll try and see if you agree is that these more costly signals are important and we should give them some more weight somehow in training the model exactly yeah. weight is is a the term we use uh, just a scaling factor on those signals that's bigger mm -hmm. than than the lower cost signals um yeah. So lower cost signals might be, you know, somebody scrolled down and, and scrolled past something uh, without mm -hmm. clicking on it, right? That, that's a low effort, low cost, low weight. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Sorry, Sorry Mark, I know you could be advan advancing these. I just stepped oh, in and done it for you. <laughs> it seems to work great. So uh, let's talk about vector search uh, vocabulary, just a few phrases. Uh, first of all, this diagram is, is uh, just, just sort of a way of thinking in a simple two-dimensional way about the relationship between different words. And uh, specifically, you know, um, those patterns of those relationships. So for example, um, women, is to queen as men is to king, right? So um, that's an example that's often often given in uh, one of the earlier uh, ones of these approaches called word to vec. So um, so in this uh, this chart is two dimensions. Uh, a vector space could be three dimensions, like you know the world we live in is three dimensions. 
and then uh but it could be many more dimensions right and those dimensions don't necessarily need to correspond to physical uh mm -hmm. parameters or or uh features like right? our color our color space example is three modeled as three dimensional and is directly related or at least it's an attempt to relate to human perception but you're saying that these other kinds of vector spaces it, i i think it might be difficult to even get it in our head <laughs> what's going on in there that's so true yep yeah. so um and then dense vectors uh in particular are not sparse vectors. A sparse vector is where you might have a lot of zeros in the vector. So for example, if you have like a spreadsheet with uh, uh, on one side, you've got um, uh, maybe um, uh, sort of documents, uh, this document, and then on the on the along the top, you've got here's the words. Or if this word is in this document, put a one in the spreadsheet. There, you'd have a lot of zeros, uh, mm -hmm. especially for less frequent words, right? So that would be a sparse matrix. It'd be huge spreadsheet, mm -hmm. and just processing it is is not uh, not very efficient. So a, a dense vector among other things, is a way to optimize that, that, that process a little bit. I think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice in, in this field of data science uh, because the phrases evoke some analogy that might not be accurate. And so I, I found that a lot of people were really interested in dense vectors without even knowing what they were for or what they were, just because it sounded cool, they're dense. <laughs> yeah. So embedding is one of the, the ways that we actually can turn words, phrases, questions, answers, uh, sentences from into those same dense vectors, right? With embedding, an easy way to think about it is you'll know a word by the company it keeps, right? So if you scan Wikipedia, for example, or a month's worth of news, um, then you might get certain associations uh, with a certain word like dog, for example, mm -hmm. um, and that those associations can be turned into this dense vector. And then um, if you have a similar um, vector that you get for cat, for example, it may have some, in, in some dimensions or, or in some way, it may be kind of close to, uh, to dog, but in other ways it might be quite different. Yeah. So, uh, so we're, what we're doing here is embedding uh, words, phrases, uh, sentences, a, a representation of them in this, this vector space that mm -hmm. has high dimensionality. Right. Okay. So I have a concept, like you said, a word, a phrase, a document. It could even be an image. We're not getting into that today, but, uh, and we're, we're finding a place for that real thing to us in this imagined vector space that's the embedding part exactly yeah so nearest neighbors um so just like your neighbors in two dimensions um you could you could have a list of uh, your neighbors and how far each of them are right mm -hmm. so the process of uh, figuring out nearest neighbors for a, a query for example um, would be to find other queries that are in the same neighborhood that are very close mm -hmm. to it. Approximately. I've, I've, I've heard that kind of described as sometimes it's like a brute force method because you have to look at all of, to know if they're close, you have to examine all the other vectors. Yeah. So, and, and we have, 
intuitive ways to to sort of narrow down the complexity of that problem, right? Mm -hmm. And some of those uh, and and others that are are more well, what are all scientifically sort of proven out are what we would call approximate nearest neighbors methods, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, called ANN. So, if if let's say we have a million phrases and we have generated vectors for all of those, we can't compute the distance between each one and all the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and minus one and and then sort that list and then figure out the neighbor like you said that would be a brute force approach that's not really efficient and something that we could do for instance at query time which needs to be really fast mm -hmm. um, so there are different approaches in terms of uh of narrowing down that search um and that's that's where we mean by uh, approximate nearest neighbors. Got it. All right. So you talked a lot, or at least mentioned models a few times. Yeah. What are you talking about, Mark? So remember, I said that you'll know a word by the company it keeps. So that's how we train these dense vector models. We we put into them, we show them, uh, we provide them lots of real world sentences, paragraphs, content. And uh, that that content then uh, allows us to uh, have relationships between words and, and phrases. Uh, so now with that training data, with any training system, you have to watch out for bias. So for example, if if you train uh, your data all on marketing content from a certain industry, uh, you're not going to get the same uh, kind of results or you wouldn't get good results if your application is news on that industry, right? Mm -hmm. one, one of those sources is kind of biased towards um, presenting the best case and, and another is maybe more objective. So um, now there's a, there's also useful bias, right? So specialization where uh, we might use different models for different concepts. Uh, we might use one color for uh, one model for color similarity, another for question and answer kind of term terms, and another one for features and and dimensions, uh, yeah. you know, two by fours and those kind of things. Right. Um, so another type of bias um, uh, would be sort of a reinforcement. So let's say you have a, a system where you're collecting signals and you're boosting based on those signals. If, if there's an item that for some reason isn't in the initial set of results, it has no way to get into those results. And so the, if there's only that feedback system, uh, a perfectly good item, may not get into the result. And so that um, that's one example of a sort of self-reinforcing system uh, that we look out for. Yeah, and very often that's what we have though. That's what we have to work with are the signals from the existing system. And we're trying to make a better system looking at those signals it almost sounds like a, a an impossible task, but there has been a lot of work in uh, recent years on this topic of counterfactual risk minimization. And so that's another topic. We could do a, an hour on that for sure. But uh, I, yeah, when you when you mention that, that's it triggers that thought for me. Then the other, uh, another type of bias, of course, is things like societal bias, where um, we want to avoid, through things like process control and review and stuff, um, any attributes that are, are boosted that, that would not be appropriate uh, in mm -hmm. that context. So in a job search uh, context, for example, we would want not want 
we want to make sure the the system didn't boost or bury any results based on age uh, right. or other demographics. But on the other hand, if the application is sort of a medical one, um, actually the user's age might be very important for um, for providing certain recommendations. Yeah. And so it's a good example of how different different systems um, may have by design different biases. Mm -hmm. and, and a part of the reason why wrangling training data and getting the training right is often more than half of the effort in one of these types of projects. Hey, Mark, I'm just um, yep. watching the time and- Totally. We'll, so, we'll keep moving. So what I've got here is a couple of models, right? So let's say this first model of a tree is sort of our, our open source model. And this second model is kind of more specialized for a willow yeah. tree and, and a little more refined, right? So what's the best model for your application? Uh, quite often, there are good open source models. They can be great for, for common language and for topics that are um, sort of more, more geared towards uh, open source ideas. So for example, clinical medical uh, data may have specialized models, but they're available in sort of an open source context. Mm -hmm. So, and then alternatively, or maybe as sort of a refinement step after you've tried out these open source models, we think uh, that e-commerce in particular is a really good uh, candidate for custom models. We talked about uh, special colors that a brand might have that, that uh, evoke certain, certain emotions, identification with, uh, with a brand attachment to it, and a culture and a differentiation from other brands. Mm -hmm. that, that can show up not only in sort of the, the, the products and, and pictures of the products, but also in the way they're described, the way they're framed, uh, the way they're used. Um, so all of that can, can depart in, in a good way uh, from sort of standard or generic ones that are trained on Wikipedia uh, information, right. for example. And, and not to be too salesy here, but that is why we in Fusion have a framework that has some kind of out of the box pre-trained models and then the capability to train on uh, a set of signals. All right, let's, I, I wanna talk quickly, but get back to that precision topic. And, and so, um, this is still semantic vector search. That's my SVS initial there. But what if the search is for a part number? So that's a very specific search. How could a semantic vector space possibly help with this? Well, let's say that we retain product data, even if, even if a product is now unavailable. It's not just out of stock. It, it's unavailable or we could just be talking about out of stock. In either case, we could retain that product's place in that vector space we talked about. And then knowing that we can't sell it, it's out of stock, it's unavailable, we can find nearest neighbors. And then with messaging, uh, explain what has happened. Couldn't find the exact thing you were looking for. And that's the image here I'm showing, uh, a nice example where this uh, Breville coffee maker is out of stock, but they're showing some alternatives. I, I, I wanna point out that a lot of our, our low performing queries and tail queries fall into this category. I'd also yeah. say that it's kind of a high effort if a user is gonna plug in a, a, a specific uh, product number, um, it's probably a good indication that they really like that product. Maybe they've bought yeah. it before and they want it again. So pretty high intent signal. Yeah, I agree. 
So I want to move from the semantic vector space. We've talked about two things so far, a, a kind of color space search, a semantic color space. We've talked about semantic vector spaces, and that's a kind of similarity. Similar things are close together, dissimilar things are far apart. Now I want to talk about this idea of semantic query parsing. And this gets back to that precision question. So I have a query, and in that query, uh, the shopper or the buyer, they've expressed certain concepts. And some of those concepts may be specifications. The idea of a semantic query parsing is to identify those concepts in the query and to be able to determine which ones require precision so that then they could have special processing. So here in this example, let's say the query was floral print, denim, maxi shirt dress, size eight, a long tail kind of a query. And we have all these concepts. We have the pattern, that floral print. We have a color, a silhouette, like the, the sh overall shape. A shirt dress is a, is a product type, arguably, and then that size. And in this uh, case of apparel, size is probably not very negotiable. Uh, so what if, what if semantic query parsing could help us understand which concepts are non-negotiable and give us a much better partial match? Today, that partial match is a very common thing. People have been doing it for many years but not doing it very well because most partial match outcomes are based on just trying, just drop this word, drop that word and see if we get results. So I'm making the case here that, and we're actually working on the semantic query parsing now, that it could de deliver a much smarter partial match. It could also help kind of put some guardrails around that semantic vector search, which tends to be fuzzier in the results it generates. So I'm gonna ask you a question, Mark. Yes. If these techniques are so awesome, why don't we just throw out the old lexical search and do everything with semantic search? Well, I, I do think that, that over time we may see us using more, uh, using semantic search more and more. It, it, it's, it's making great strides uh, in the literature and, and mm -hmm. applications, but there are go always going to be cases where a user has specified very, something very, very well, and it matches mm -hmm. very well in, in something that's available. So yeah. in those cases, we're always going to try to give the user exactly what they want there. In yeah. your uh, periwinkle example, if the user searching for periwinkle, which is not a frequent term, and uh, we've got some great uh, products that, with that same word in it, then lexical search works really well. Yeah. And, and there's no reason to go do a semantic search for a part number usually <laughs> exactly yeah yeah but if a, as we said a part number is not available or maybe mm. it leads to related parts and other things like that that can that can still be um useful yeah absolutely in yeah. the semantic search world okay let's talk a little bit about uh how to get started my take on this is um Start with low risk use cases and zero results is a very nice one. I wouldn't say you can't do any worse than zero results because I think you could. <laughs> you could give a totally irrelevant result, but the semantic vector search approach is excellent for these zero results or long tail, low performing outcomes. Uh, 
so my, my take is identify some low risk use cases, which generally means you're really doing poorly in these use cases and determine which of these techniques we've described uh, are best fit. And I, I really favor semantic vector search as a nice starting point because it is kind of fuzzy and scoops in a lot and you can put some messaging around it to clarify that it's not a precise result. Uh, what's your take, Mark? Yeah, I, I generally try to take a crawl, walk, run kind of approach. So mm -hmm. one of the first things we can do in, in a data science context is we can think about offline sort of analysis. We can take our queries, for example, from signals. We, we can compare, um, we can vectorize those queries um, using these embeddings and off the shelf models and find mappings between queries that don't perform well and those that get a lot of clicks. Yeah. So that's kind of an offline or, or pre-production way of, of saying, wow, this, this is working really well and it's going to work well for underperforming queries mm -hmm. and null queries. Yeah, that's a nice way to uh, reduce risk too. Uh, what do you think? Should we call this good for the presentation and see if we have some questions? Yes. All right. Well, thanks. Nice Thank chatting you. with you, Mark. And you, Eric. <laughs> All right, Eric and Mark. This is Jill, your webinar host, coming back on the line with a few questions from our audience here. Um, first question is, would nearest neighbor be similar to the Liebenstein distance? Oh, that's a good one. Um, it is, so I, I get there is a, a similarity in that you're trying to approximate is how similar is this to that. But a actually, it's not very similar in how it's implemented. So if you think about approximate nearest neighbors or nearest neighbors, um, it is based on a model learning from some kind of training data, shopping behavior or something. Whereas some of these others, uh, like Levenstein and other um, uh, string similarity approaches mm -hmm. are more about kind of what's the cost to make this thing like that thing. And so, yes, in general, it's, it's similar in that we're talking about similarity, uh, the, the idea of how different is this than that, but the approach is pretty different. In, and how you get there. Yeah, degree of difference, I think, is is the where those are similar. I think, mm -hmm. uh, I guess an illustration would be something like a zip code, right? If you change the third digit in a zip code, it would, or the second, uh, or the first one, uh, they might be very, very far apart in the, on a map, uh, right? Mm -hmm. but, but in a, in a Levenstein kind of concept, uh, uh, edit distance way, it's only one character difference. Yeah, yeah, right. And and there's a whole topic that this brings, sorry, I'm not going to take away from the question, but the idea of hard negatives uh, is something we pay a lot of attention to in a semantic space. And that means you could have a very short edit distance, but in fact, they're really different. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Next question. How long does it take to get started with semantic search? It, uh, yeah, so we have uh, models and model frameworks ready to go, but the training is the thing. And so if it's uh, a case where a pre trained model works pretty well, then super fast you know, we can, we can have a POC ready to go in very few days. But if we determine that we need some specialization, as Mark was talking about earlier, based on some signals data, we probably want to have uh, weeks of signals data, maybe a month or more. 
in order to get a, a good improvement by training a custom model. Mark, what are your thoughts on? Yeah, I, I think it's going to depend heavily on the the, the patterns that mm -hmm. are hopefully available in signals uh, data, mm -hmm. but it's also going to depend on the application. And so, for example, you might use an off-the-shelf um, uh, uh, model and try it, right? Mm -hmm. And after trying it, you might say, yeah, we're going to need a more specialized model, right? So you can use cross-validation, error rates, and those sort of data science discipline approaches to evaluating those models and how effective they're going to be for you. I think in e-commerce, and when we're talking about product data, as opposed to documents and service content and so on, we do tend to see that a specialized model or a, a trained on that company's data is important. Yeah. And so one thing that's helpful to me is when a client says, hey, we're thinking of going down this path. We want to do that semantic vector search thing. I say, let's talk about the data you should start capturing now from your signals. So they're ready to go when they uh, finally decide to start down that path. All right, wonderful, thank you. And we have just a couple moments left here. So in 60 seconds or less, can you answer me? Is semantic search slower? Is it slower? Uh, the actual query is very often faster than, say, a lexical approach. Mark, what's your experience? Well, I've actually sort of drilled into real-world data here recently uh, for one of our, our large e-commerce customers, and the answer is about 50 milliseconds. So to be kind of specific, um, Yes, it is a little bit slower than than a, say a lexical search. And in this case, it's also related to sort of a fallback approach um, or multi-stage approach. But it's re it's remarkably fast. the The algorithms for figuring out those nearest neighbors are are pretty sophisticated, optimized, and the 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 topic of ongoing, research and, and development. So um, it's- It'll it's keep getting faster. That's right. Yeah. All right, thank you. So we're just about out of time. That was incredibly insightful, both uh, Eric and Mark. We thank you for joining us for this last hour um, to talk about fix, how to fix dead end searches and boost e-commerce conversions. Um, as a reminder to our audience, we will be sending a follow-up email that will um, contain a link to re-watch this webinar or to share it with colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Eric, Mark, uh, again, thank you for your time. Really enjoyed this last hour with you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.